large companies can be the result of healthy competition. But some very powerful companies, so-called dominant firms, can abuse their position to exclude or seriously hinder efficient or innovative rivals, thus depriving consumers of the benefits of competition. These strategies are called abuse of dominance or monopolization in some countries and are violation of competition law that can result in fines and orders to seize the strategy in question. It is important to highlight that only a few companies under specific circumstances have enough power to harm competition by following these strategies. In the absence of a dominant position, there is no room for antitrust intervention against unilateral conduct. Therefore, before questioning any practice, competition authorities must identify the so-called relevant market, that is the competitive arena, which includes effective and potential competitors, and then assess whether the company holds a dominant position in the market. Defining the market is a complex issue. We will address it in a dedicated video shortly. Let's move directly to the second step, assessing market power. When is a company dominant? Well, being big is not enough. The European Commission defines dominance as a position of economic strength that enables the company to behave independently of its competitors, customers and consumers. Similarly, other jurisdictions like the US and Japan focus on the long-term ability to raise prices or exclude competitors. The assessment of market power takes into account a number of variables. Competition authorities often use market shares as an initial indicator. However, this is only the start of the process. Other fundamental factors are the availability of alternatives for consumers and ease of market entry. Because market power increases when consumers do not have access to alternative products. A lot of different types of practices that might be considered an abuse of dominance or monopolization strategy. The most important thing to remember is that a given practice might be pro-competitive and beneficial in some situations and it might be anti-competitive and harmful in another. So it's really crucial for a competition authority to engage in thorough analysis that is tailored to the particular facts and realities of a given case. One common source of concern is that a firm imposes an exclusivity clause on its customers or it might offer its customers a loyalty rebate and that might actually hinder its competitors access to the market. Now there's a tip for investigating this type of conduct and it's to ask whether there are any kind of beneficial efficiencies that would justify the imposition of these terms. Tying and bundling strategies are another example of potential exclusionary conduct. So this can come in the form of bundling discounts or simply refusing to sell products individually, uh, usually when they're complements or related products. Now bundling can actually be used by firms that are dominant in one market in order to foreclose competition in another market. In some markets, a company holds an essential input. So for example, it manages an airport uh, or a port or it has access to extensive energy or telecom networks. And at the same time, it might compete downstream with certain firms that rely on the input. In these situations, the firm might be able to leverage its power over this very essential input in order to harm rivals. Uh, it might do so by denying them access to the input, which we call refusal to deal. Um, or it might charge a price that makes it very difficult for its competitors to compete, uh, something we call margin squeeze. Now remember that an input must be truly indispensable or essential uh, in order for this theory to apply. Another common concern is predatory pricing, uh, in which a dominant firm sets a price well below the competitive level in order to push its competitors out of the market, and then once they're gone, take advantage of entry barriers in order to raise prices afterward. Now this can be a particularly tricky strategy to investigate because oftentimes low prices are pro-competitive, a sign of healthy competition. 
So what this theory of harm really relies on is the ability of a firm after the exit of competitors uh, to be able to raise prices and take advantage of its market power. Now the practices that I've mentioned so far uh, focus on either pushing competitors out of the market, so these are exclusionary abuses, um, or they have the effect of raising their rivals costs and making it harder for them to compete. Now some jurisdictions also consider what we call exploitative abuses, uh, which involves imposing unfair or potentially discriminatory terms uh, on their consumers. Now care should really be used in determining what constitutes an unfair term, and it can be really challenging to find objective benchmarks for these types of cases. To sum up, dominant firms can harm competition by excluding their contenders or raising their costs. The challenge for competition authorities is first to determine whether they have sufficient market power to do so, and second, to distinguish between legitimate aggressive competition and abusive conduct. Remember that dominant firms have the right to compete vigorously. Competition laws do not protect competitors, they protect competition. Over the last few years, competition authorities across the world have increasingly launched abuse investigations involving digital giants, in some cases leading to very high fines. These cases have confirmed how important it is to strike a balance between the need to respect the commercial freedom on the one hand and the need to swiftly intervene to maintain open competitive markets on the other hand in order to really protect consumers and promote economic well-being.